Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to musician Glenn Burtnick, who you may know from his solo career, from playing Paul McCartney in the original West Coast version of Beatlemania, to his work with the Stone Pony house band Cats on a Smooth Surface, or as the guy who stepped into Tommy Shaw's shoes with sticks. As for me, I'll always know Glenn as the older kid next door when we were growing up in apartments on Phillips Road in Somerset, New Jersey. Stick around. You never know what could come next. So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is a Mr. Media Interview, brought to you by Amazon.com, Audible.com, and 1-800-DIAL-DJs. Please stop by the website, MrMedia.com, click on our advertisers, support the show. And remember, there's more than a thousand interviews available at MrMedia.com. We've been doing this since February 2007. Hope you'll find something you like. And thanks for listening. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience that includes Southside Johnny, John Eddy, Phil Garland, and a bunch of other guys briefly pronounced as the next big thing from New Jersey in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. There aren't many people, besides my mom, who I could introduce by saying I've known them all my life. But that's true of Glenn Burtnick. But don't get me wrong, I'm not at all suggesting we know each other well or have ever even hung out. It's just that in the early 1960s, our families were neighbors in a low-rent apartment complex in Somerset, New Jersey. Our moms were friends and remained so for many years to come, even as both families separately relocated to more suburban digs in North Brunswick. Now, Glenn was the first person to ever attempt to teach me how to play the guitar. The first of many to fail at that task, I might add, but the only one who went on to play Paul McCartney in Beatlemania. Now, he also married Rosemary, beautiful girl down the street, so I saw him in passing from time to time. Now, the only time I believe we were ever in the same room together in the last 40 plus years was probably around 1984, I think, could be wrong, when my wife and I went to the Stone Pony in Asbury Park on a Sunday night to wait with the faithful to see if Bruce Springsteen would show up and play a set with the club's house band, Cat on, Cats on a Smooth Surface. Their guitarist, Glenn Burtnick. Now I'm waiting for Glenn to see if he corrects me and say that, that was, the timing is off. Uh, you're doing great. Okay. Wow. All right. Uh, music has been very good to Glenn over the years. During his Beatlemania run, he built a lasting friendship with the performer cast as John Lennon, a guy you also may have heard of, Marshall Crenshaw. And during that same period of time, he was hired by Jan Hammer to be the singer in his band, Hammer. And that's how he met his friend and future Santana and Journey player, Neil Schoen. Now, a little bit of an aside. During his time with Cats on a, on a Smooth Surface, he became friendly with a guy named John Bon Jovi, who invited him to join his new band. Glenn declined. Bon Jovi went on without him. Don't know whatever happened to him, though. Glenn, <laughs> Glenn recorded two solo albums for A&M Records, Heroes and Zeros, and Talking in Code. When going out on his own didn't work out as he hoped, he received a phone message one day from Dennis DeYoung asking if he would consider auditioning for his band, Styx. Tommy Shaw had moved on to tour with Damn Yankees, and the band needed a second guitarist and another songwriter. Now, if you didn't know Glenn before, you've certainly got several good reasons to get to know my old neighbor now. And by the way, you can see Glenn live in concert with the orchestra. 
that's featuring former members of the Electric Light Orchestra and ELO 2 at Ruth Eckert Hall in Clearwater, Florida on Friday, January 31st. I don't know the time. Uh, get tickets online at RuthEckertHall.com. And no, I just checked, Glenn was neither a member of ELO or ELO 2. We'll talk about that. Glenn Burtnick, welcome to Mr. Media. Hey, thanks for having me again. <laughs> Good to see you. Uh, so, uh, Glenn, uh, you know what's new since '65? Get me caught up. Woo! Uh, since 1965, uh, we landed on the moon. Uh-huh. I uh, graduated high school, and I uh, stubbornly refused to give up my um, dream of making music and making a living at music. You know, the older I get, the more I question uh, that decision, but uh, yeah, I am very fortunate. Um, you know, I'm 58 now, so I basically consider myself 60 because you had $58 in your pocket and somebody asked you, you know, how, how much you got on you, you'd say 60. Right? So, um, but anyway, I'm almost 60 years old and I have made a living in a odd career and I've, I've done a lot of things. I've, I've written hit songs and I've played in a number of different types of acts and, um, and I've worn as many hats as I could and uh, it's uh, you know it's been a really good run and I'm kind of cracking up at uh, the fact that I'm still doing what I basically what I wanted to do and started doing at you know 16 years old or something, you know, I'm basically getting up on stage and, you know, make, playing make-believe rock star and, uh, and an audience, you know, loves me for it and they clap and I'm like, yeah, so I get a lot of, you know, gratification out of that, that career choice. What was it as a teenager that, that turned you on to, not just music, because, you know, everybody loves music as a teen, but made you want to be the guy on stage playing the music instead of just, you know one of us guys out in the, in the audience clapping and cheering? Well, you know, like, like I said, I was a little stubborn. Um, I went, I'm told by my family that when I was, before I was talking, uh, I would um, react to music. You know, like if, a, if a, a beautiful song would come on the radio or something, I would start crying and stuff. Like music has always had like a super emotional effect on me. So there was that. I mean, I was always drawn to, to music. And then, when I was around eight or nine, the Beatles came on Ed Sullivan. And, and so then I got caught, and that was huge, a huge cultural moment. And I got, you know, wrapped up in the music of the 60s. Um, after the Beatles came, you know, Bob Dylan and Jimi Hendrix and all this uh, wonderful music. The 60s were really an explosion of pop culture. And, uh, and, and those were formative years for me. And, uh, and uh, so I think the combination of being a, very attuned to music, uh, getting, you know, feeling emotionally drawn to it, and living through this decade of um, uh, incredible uh, uh, in inspirational pop music, which, by the way, continues, won't let go, you know, I mean, I do a lot of Beatles shows, I, I appear at Beatle conventions and stuff like that, and there's there's no shortage of young people that are still drawn to the music of the Beatles, so, in fact, I, I hang out with a lot of younger musicians, and they all are, are emulating music from my youth, and it cracks me up, it's like, you know, young guys um, trying to emulate the band, or some past, you know, some groups from the 60s. But anyway, so I think the combination of all of those elements just kind of sucked me in and, uh, and I, I just followed, I followed my uh, dream. Do you remember the first person who said, yeah, you could do that, maybe heard you singing and go, yeah, you should op uh, go on stage or enter a contest or you have a good voice, you, you can play? Uh. I mean, slowly, I, I wasn't very good, I don't think. I thought I was good. I've, o I've always thought I was good, but I, I didn't really hear a lot of encouragement. But although my 
my folks, my family wasn't discouraging. You know, my mom got a drum set for me, and uh, uh, and a guitar found its way home. My, one of my brothers brought a guitar home, and I, you know, and I just stubbornly thought that everything I came up with, everything I wrote, I thought was just brilliant. You know, and I'm sure it wasn't. I mean, I can't remember those early songs, but um, I, it, like I said, it was just this. You know, I was tuned to the same channel. You know, it's like the, uh, I'm, I'm going to make it, I'm brilliant, I'm the next Bob Dylan, whatever, you know, and uh, so I just kind of stuck with it. I'm sure at some point, you know, when I was in high school, I had a music teacher that, uh, that took notes, you know, and I, I think it's also, it's not, because of that stubborn streak that I'm talking about, I think what that is is ambition, and when you meet somebody that has a lot of drive, uh, you... And, and you realize that they're very uh, serious about drive, and very uh, just motivated. Uh, you take note and you say, wow, this person's working very hard and uh, I'll bet you they go someplace. So, I don't know, I mean, and my songwriting got better as I kept doing it and doing it and doing it. Uh, I've written a, a lot of songs in my life. So, I, you know, and then when you get the big record deal or when I pass the audition for uh, Beatlemania, when you go auditioning is a scary thing. When you you know, I went up and I auditioned, and then they said, um, "You got the gig." That's uh, gratifying and a pat on the back. So I, I seem to always get enough uh, support to make me uh, convinced that I was right. Well, the story uh, that I've seen is with the Beatlemania because you, you you basically you make this leap from being this high school kid who, who, who wants to play music and believes in his own head that he can do this and is good at it, and then the next big thing seems to be the Beatlemania. Did, did, uh, you, you saw an ad in the Village Voice and for auditions. Did you know what you were even auditioning for at the time? Would they actually have gone that far and said? Yeah, the, the show had been in production a year already. Yeah. And um, so I, I was aware of the show that Interestingly, I did not approve of the show. I thought it was, I, I thought it was kind of a cheap imitation kind of thing. Uh, but as a young musician looking for breaks and stuff like that, I I auditioned um, because I figured, well, you know, maybe there's some money here, maybe I'll get paid. Um, and when I passed the audition. Uh, I still had this feeling of like I'm not sure I want to do this or not and, and the uh, musical director asked me well have you ever seen the show and I said no and he said come on with me like that night I think or maybe a few nights later I went to see Beatlemania and um, it completely got me I was like wow I want to be a Beatle you know, I've always wanted to be a Beatle and there it was four guys on stage and is in a beautiful theater, playing these songs that I grew up with. It's like, how could I say no? I was, and I was a young man. I, I was, um, and you know, and what's funny is it was only, it was less than ten years after the Beatles had broken up, and less than twenty years since they had exploded. So it was really very, just judging by the way I look at life now, time now. Um, it was. Soon after the Beatles had actually, you know, become the cultural icons that they did. But uh, yeah, so I, you know, I went along with it because I thought, well, that, that looks like a fine, you know, gig, and uh, and I enjoyed it. I did enjoy it. I I got out of it kind of quick. I did it for a year, and then I got sick of it because it was very. Um, it was more of a well. It was a lot like a play. Uh, they didn't want you to uh, vary much from a script, and um, you know, so that's kind of uninspired, or it wasn't used to what I was used to, which is like rock and roll. I was like a rock and roll guy, and so I didn't. Uh, so I felt a, a, a little, I don't know, compromised and controlled. So after about a year, 
I left, and that's when I saw another ad in the Village Voice for uh, Jan Hammer, who I was a fan of, um, and I, you know, so I answered that ad too. Well, let's let's hold off on Jan for a second. <clears throat> you play a, a year of shows. Uh, this was out on the West Coast. First of all, had you even been on the West Coast before? No, that was my trip to uh, the West Coast. It was my first time in L.A. They flew me out, and uh, it was wonderful. But also, I might add that I have a distinct memory that those were the day. It was 1978, and those were the days that. Uh, Air, air flight was still kind of glamorous and <laughs> and so I sat on a plane with a big plane like a jumbo jet and there were hardly anybody around me. I mean I was like it was like an open plane it's all me you know? and and you know now as you probably know you get on an airplane and there's every seat is sold and in fact they oversell right I spent a lot of time on, on airplanes now, but uh but back then, I felt like I had my own flight attendant, my personal flight attendant. So anyway, yes, I, I went to um, Los Angeles for the first time and then did the show there for about six months and then did the show in San Francisco for about four months and then did the show in San Diego for about two months. And then, uh, and then I, 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 well, then we were done with that run and I quit. You know, I said, well, see you guys. That's when I started to do other things. So you, <clears throat> you went from having not been out to the West Coast, having not been on stage, per se, day after day. It sounds like it was an incredible experience for the future of your career because you probably – I'm just going to guess here. You just stop me if I get it wrong. But you, you learned how to travel. You learned how to be out on the road. You learned how to give a consistent performance day after day, I'm guessing. Uh, and uh, it probably moved your career – dramatically forward in ways that you could n no one could have predicted to you a year earlier I think so um, I, I learned a lot like as you pointed out I also learned you know it was a very um, dedicated show uh, it, instead of just doing uh, arrangements of Beatles songs it was you know, about being a stickler for playing the, the bass parts on the record and singing the same phrasing that were on the records. And, you know, it was very, very uh, attuned to uh, trying to recreate as close to perfect uh, these records. So it, it, it was a learning experience musically for me and professionally about touring and traveling. And also, you know, I've always said I, I didn't go to college, I went to Beatlemania. And, <laughs> and, um, my the guys that I worked with, because there were two casts for every show, and um, all those guys from Beatlemania, they're still, they're kind of like my army buddies, you know, or you know, college fraternity, you know, in, in a way, because we keep in touch, we occasionally get together for, you know, weddings and stuff, and um, yeah, so it was, uh, you know, it, it was an important um, part of my life. For sure. And did you and uh, Marshall Crenshaw start at the same time? Pretty much, yeah, yeah. And did you, did you? Uh, I mean, you, you, you must look back now and go, yeah. I mean, we both were talented guys, and we both have had careers. Uh, anyone else from that cast uh, uh, break out in the same way that you guys eventually did? Well. Marshall would be the most successful. Um, uh, well, there was a guy named uh, David Leon. He was a John Lennon character, as was Marshall. Mm -hmm. David um, got a record deal with a band called Helmet Boy, and he called me to ask me to come out and um, join the band. So I joined that band, and we made a record on... Electro Asylum records. So you know, th there were Rob Lauper was a, uh, um, George Harrison as well. There were a couple of guys, but for the most part, um, just a few of us actually kind of moved on to a another 
career a point, you know, like a, a job. Well, so I, I'm asking a little bit more about the Beatlemania thing right now, just because of the timing. Uh, about two weeks from when you and I are talking, maybe three weeks, math was never my thing, um, it's the, the 50th anniversary of the first Beatles concert in the U.S. So, you know, it's a, I think we're going to find that people are a little more tuned into Beatles stuff. Uh, do, you, do you recall, um, were people upset about the play out on the West Coast? Uh, you know, was it ruffling feathers? Did you ever get any sense, or on the opposite end of that, did you ever get any sense that anyone from the Beatles had come in to see the play? Reportedly, none of the Beatles did. Uh, uh, one guy from the cast, from the original cast, Mitch Weissman, who was a, a, a Paul McCartney lookalike, he um, encountered John Lennon on the streets back then, and uh, and and they so they spoke a little bit. He said that Lennon was very kind, and Lennon said, "Yeah, my son Julian saw the show, and he said it's really great." Wow, cool. So, but yeah, now none of the Beatles have. Uh, Seen that show, and I, I don't know that they're interested. But there's so much now. In retrospect, it just you know it just dawned on me also that uh, you know I'm left-handed and I play the bass the left left-handed, and that probably helped get me good because there were because there were a lot of McCartney is left-handed, and there there were a lot of uh, some of the other Pauls in the in the show were right-handed, but uh, but I kind of came in with that. Fiction. Cool. All right. All right. So you you, you mentioned uh, Jan Hammer a little while ago, and I I, I deferred that to now. Um, it, what was the timing on working with Hammer? Was that before or after Miami Vice? I'm not really clear on that. Oh yeah, before. Uh, the Jan Hammer was the synthesizer player, the keyboard player for Mahavishnu Orchestra, mm -hmm. and then he got involved with Jeff Beck. He wrote, produced, and played on a number of Jeff Beck records, and um, so that was all right up my alley. I was, I was very intrigued by Jan, and uh, he's a brilliant musician, and uh, so I answered that ad. I sent him a bunch of songs, and they were interested, you know, and um, so I got that gig. Classified advertising been very important to Glenn Burtnick. <laughs> There's a whole generation out there that, that, that may not get their opportunities because classified ads are going away. What do, you, what do we do about that? I don't know. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I guess I'm going to jump around a little bit, but as I, as I kind of gave the sense of people in the introduction, there's a lot of Glenn Burtnick history because you've played with a lot of people. You've done a lot of things. Um, I'm kind of curious, when you... Um, you're largely associated with the Jersey Shore now. I, I think you... Correct me if I'm wrong. I think you're actually living in that area, right? Yeah, I'm so living in Asbury Park. Yeah. Oh, you actually are in Asbury. Yeah. Okay. Um, was it hard uh, for people, let's say in the in the '80s, particularly, uh, who were musicians, to to come out of that area uh, because of the the big shadow cast by uh, Springsteen? I, I don't think so. I mean, I I think it actually helped. You know, uh, Bruce is. Uh, success was so large that um, it was, you know, it was a story to talk about um, if you're doing an interview or, or whatever, you know, in your bio or something to say that, you, you know, I mean, I've played with Bruce Springsteen a number of times because he loves to play and I'll get up, with that. I'll get up at a bar and play with him. Mm -hmm. And um, so you kind of feel like, you know, you're in the presence of greatness and you feel like maybe you're in a fraternity. Of uh, you know, Asbury Park musicians, and that. so I don't think it was hard. What I actually, what I didn't want to do was talk about Beatlemania um, when I <laughs> when I did interviews for my solo career. So any any of my stuff, I kind of kept that quiet because I just thought, you know, I don't know, it's not it's not the most. Uh, I don't know. It's, it, there was an imitation factor to being a Beatlemania at the time. I just thought I was a little embarrassed about it, so I didn't talk about it. Well, I was curious. You know, I remember um, in my, my my visits 
uh, up to New Jersey over the years have, have become, you know, more and more stretched apart. But there was one time in the 80s that I came up uh, and there was a club. You'll probably remember the name of it. It was it was on Route 1, close to 130, where the Boy Scouts used to be. It was a big club, and they used to book national acts in there. Yeah. Um, like, uh, the Royal Manor for a while. Yeah, I think, yeah, that sounds familiar, something like that. And I, it just happened that the, the week that I was there, uh, they had Clarence Clemens and the Red Bank Rockers, uh, and opening for them was John Eddy. And I had heard about Eddie, but he hadn't recorded, I don't think, at that point. And he was one of these guys who, and there have been a number of them over the years. I kind of make reference to that uh, kiddingly in the introduction. A lot of guys who have been the next Springsteen or the next, you know. And so I thought a lot of pressure on, on, on Eddie, I think, to be that guy. And then he had to go, it seems to me, and maybe I got this wrong, it seems to me that he kind of had to disappear for a while and he remade himself over the years as more of a country guy. And seems to have found uh, his uh, his comfort level there. Yeah, he's, he's actually doing really good. He's written a song or two that uh, was cut by oh my gosh, the, uh, uh, I can't remember right now. But he's uh, the guy that used to go out with Cheryl Crow. Anyway, and wears a hat. Anyway, so he he he's actually had a couple of uh, big records that he's written for others, and he's doing good. Yeah, he's, but he definitely very inspired by Bruce. Right. He yeah. That, much is a uh, he owes a lot to Bruce. He's a friend of mine and and uh, hardworking guy. Yeah, I I I've got uh, just happened over the years uh, upon some singles of his. Uh, uh, the one I really like was uh, I want to say it's it's called Forty, where he sings about uh, being forty and uh, you know well. You know, Bruce Springsteen's 53, or the Stones are nearly dead. And, uh, I saw that, and then I started tracking down some more stuff. And uh, anyway, I've been trying to get him to come on for a while. Maybe, uh, maybe he'll see you, and he'll go, "Oh yeah, well, okay." If, if I, next time I see him, I'll put in a good word. That would be nice. So let's come back to the pony for a minute. So I mentioned that uh, my wife and I had come up there. I basically had come up there at the time to do a story for the St. Petersburg Times about this whole phenomenon of Sunday nights and, you know, is Bruce going to show up? And the rumors are always going around. And I assume that the rumors were fed by whoever owned or managed the pony uh, that, you know. I, I, so I'm hoping that you can, for people who never had that experience of being up there when 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 cats were playing and Bruce would show up and play, maybe you can give us a little sense of that. Uh, for example, did you actually know ahead of time if, if he or somebody else was going to show up or was it really that random? Sometimes we would know, um, but usually he would just hang. You know? he, he would just kind of come out. And, you know, I mean, um, I, I'll say this: that often uh, I would, uh, I would know he was in the club or the bar because I, uh, the, because the audience would suddenly change. <laughs> And and they and and a lot of like the audience would come to the front of the stage and just stand there, <laughs> and you thought like okay what, why and and they just kind of stare at you and then you realize they're not really watching us they're waiting for something mm -hmm. you know and so you just so a lot of times you just know what uh, one of my favorite stories is that he was in the bar he didn't do anything he didn't get up buddy and. Uh, we finished our set and it was like encore time or something. And I walked out the stage door and the audience is clapping to bring us back on. And there's Bruce walking on the sidewalk. And I said, Hey, Bruce, you want to play? He's like, ah, I don't know. I said, Come on. And he said, Ah, all right. <laughs> so it, was, it was kind of me asking, you know, getting Bruce to get up, which uh, was kind of nice. Cool. And what kind of stuff? On those nights, what would you play, and and were you always prepared for what? Uh, was he prepared for what you were going to play, or were you you would have to be prepared, I suspect, for what he wanted to play? He's pretty notorious for getting up when he gets up at a jam or something. He, you know, he's going to do like Mustang Sally and Twisted Shout and kind of these very simple R and B chestnut early rock and roll kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, Keeps it simple, which makes sense because then there, you know, there won't be any train wrecks on stage. 
Um, yeah, he, he likes to do the uh, those workhorses. Songs. Raise your hand, I'm sure. Um, would it be fun for you guys, or would it be disruptive? Would you, you know, were there nights where you'd come in and you just want to get through your gig, go home, or you know, was that something that you know was always special? Always special. Mm -hmm. You know, you're you're definitely in the presence of greatness, and you're collaborating to a certain extent with a superstar, an iconic uh, musician. And uh, I understand Cats, Cats on a Smooth Surface was not a bad band at itself. Who else was in the band over the years that you played with? Well, Bobby Bandiera uh, was the, guitar, the other guitarist. And he went on to, uh, well, he plays with Bon Jovi, yeah. like the second guitar player in Bon Jovi for years. Um, Fran Smith was the bass player, and he went on to be in the Hooters. Hmm. Remember the Hooters? I do. Yeah. And uh, so there's... Oh, and Ray Anderson, uh, the keyboard player, he did a tour with Meatloaf, and um, that's kind of all I remember, but that's not bad, that's not bad. No. bad. It's funny about the Hooters, my sister actually, my sister went to school at uh, Glassboro eventually, and uh, she actually was the one who turned me on to uh, the Hooters and sent me an uh, album at the time it was probably an 8-track knowing me she probably sent me an 8-track and I thought these guys were great and it was only about a week ago that I heard one of their songs on the radio they had a very distinctive sound and I said to my, my daughter who's now 17 I said that was a great band I don't know what ever happened to them but they had this very unique sound and it just didn't seem like they went beyond an album or two yeah well they stopped having hits but they keep making records and they have a um they have a, a successful career in Europe. They they tour, they go over to Germany like at least once a year, and um, which is not unusual. Uh, European audiences are a little less trendy. Um, they they love um, that, that you know they'll stick with an artist uh, beyond their hit making. Years. So. Um, yeah, so they have a, they still play. I'm glad to hear that. Actually, it's uh, it's nice to hear. Maybe there's some chance they'll wind up down here touring or something. Um, speaking of Europe, as someone who's been following you on Facebook for a while, you've uh, you seem to be doing pretty well with that uh, uh, that racket as well, getting over there frequently. Yeah, the orchestra in particular, uh, the ELO band, um, uh, does a lot of touring. In, uh, Europe, Eastern Europe, Russia, uh, South America, and uh, we've been up to uh, Alaska as well. Like a, a lot of traveling, you know, um, which is awesome. You know, I mean, I was like standing in Red Square a couple of months ago. You know, just like amazing, wow. amazing uh, travel and beautiful Italy, Spain. You know, just seeing the world. Which also cracks me up that at this age I'm still touring and playing all these uh, exotic, I think exotic places, and um, you know getting paid. Well, and does it? I, I mean, I, don't take this the wrong way because I don't mean it badly. I, I have a feeling it's going to come out the wrong way. But does it bother you at all that as you look back? I mean, as you know, as I'm getting ready to talk to you today, if, if you know, for a real interview, I'm looking at okay. He did the year with the Beatlemania playing Beatles songs. He, um, more recently, you know, you stepped in for Styx twice, uh, have toured and written songs and recorded with Styx. Now, uh, the orchestra, which is made up of ELO members. Um, it seems like that has been a, a very good source of work and income for you. Uh, probably not where you would like to be, I'm guessing, in terms of being able to re record and, and, and get out there on, on your own music more often. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, I do record occasionally now, and uh, I'll put a song on iTunes or something, but uh, it's not really so cost-effective anymore. I don't have that many fans. Um, I do, you know, a lot of people might know my name, maybe, but uh, uh, my original music uh, isn't, you know, yielding what it once did. Uh, I was a very successful songwriter throughout the 90s. 
And um, but then I joined Sticks, rejoined Sticks, and um, and and that's when I was taken out on the road for about ten years because Sticks plays all the time. They're very very busy band, and um, so they, you know, so I, I guess, you know, the, and. and when I got off the road from Sticks, I, I kind of, I was out of the loop, the songwriting loop, and there was a whole new generation of uh, hip hop and stuff, music that was uh, taking over the pop charts, and what I did wasn't necessarily in vogue. Mm -hmm. So, um, eh, yeah, maybe, yes. Um, but I'll tell you, the life of a original solo artist or whatever, uh, or an original band, um, it's hard um, unless you make a big, big splash. It's uh, you're not um, you're not traveling easy, and uh, it's pretty hard travel. Whereas if with a band like Sticks or a band like the Orchestra, um, we're well compensated to play music that I had no part of. Or well, with Sticks, I did write a lot, but. In any case, but their their biggest records I, I wasn't on. So um, and like I said, as I get older, I uh, I don't feel like I need the ego gratification so much. I, it's like a it's a career, it's a business job, and I'm I'm very pleased to get paid to do what's really fun. Absolutely, I, I think it's awesome that you know. Let's say forty years since you've started professionally. I don't know what, how exactly how old you were when you started with Beatlemania, but I mean that's a long time to be making a pretty good living as a musician. Uh, you've you've played your own music at times. You you're playing other people's music, but you're still playing. You're up on stage. You're seeing in fr front of you know thousands of people, and uh, I think it's I think it's amazing. It's great. Yeah, it's it's a blessing. You know, I'm I just feel really fortunate, and I. And I don't take it lightly. I enjoy it, you know, and I, I appreciate the uh, the breaks because I, I do have a number of friends that I've played with throughout the years that uh, just never got that kind of the kind of breaks that I've had, and um, you know, so I, I recognize how fortunate I've been. And uh, just the last question about sticks: uh, is are they still touring? Or are you still part of that? If they do go out, how does that? Stand. No, no, I left that band. What was what was happening was that my marriage was falling apart, partially because I was away all the time. Mm. And uh, so I, I said, you know, in order to, in order to save my marriage, I got to leave leave the band, which I did, but I, I but it, it didn't work. Uh, uh, so I got divorced, and um, you know, but they are definitely still touring. They're a very busy band. They they kind of live on the bus, you know. Mm. Which, you know, that's they, they're well taken care of. But it is that's a little hard too. You're, you're sleeping on a bus and, uh, and driving and driving and driving. You know, so it's not all fun and games. Um, I, to be honest, <clears throat> Glenn, I got to tell you, I'm I'm I'm. It's just I'm just as glad that you're not still part of the band with sticks because I didn't want to get caught in a conversation of being asked or having to think up a, a stick song that I like because there really were none. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, I, I remember covering them as a music critic for the St. Pete Times back in the 80s and it's the kind of thing where it's like I had to go there and I was there and I tried to evaluate based on what I saw. I didn't try to give away that I just wasn't a Styx fan, but it just wasn't my thing. Now, ELO, on the other hand, I want to ask you about ELO, about playing ELO songs because I actually like ELO. Um, do you have... Uh, well, it's two, two questions, really, about ELO. Do you have any favorites among their songs? And, and are there any that are particularly difficult, that were difficult to learn? Because it seemed to me that their music was a little more complicated than the average pop song. Yeah, well, first of all, I, I, I want to say that I was not a Sticks fan myself. <laughs> so when I got, call, I got the call from Dennis DeYoung, I was like... You know, it was a practical, um, it was a practical job for me. And, but then I and I was ambitious, so I wrote a number of songs that, uh, uh, you know, that the band recorded, and I, you know, so I kind of did well with that move. Although, yeah, um, there are some I like Tommy Shaw's material a lot, and uh, well, 
they, they had their moments. But with ELO, um, uh, yeah, I, I prefer ELO music to uh, stick music for sure. Um, and uh, I can tell you that Mr. Blue Skies to me is uh, it's like as good as any Beatle record. Mm -hmm. That song, I have cried on stage when, when I see, uh, you know, when an audience responds to that song, which I think is musically very um, compelling. Um, and I'm happy to say I get to sing that song. So I'm, I just, I'm in heaven singing a song that I admire that much. Um, yeah, and the audiences really do uh, come alive with that stuff. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I totally love doing that, that music. All right, and I'm just going to say, for me it would be Don't Bring Me Down. I just think that's a great song. I never get tired of that. Yeah, that's our final song of the night. You know, that's our encore number, and yeah, people lose their minds over it. Yeah, I, you know, and is it is it you know? I remember when ELO was 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 starting out. A lot of people dismissed them. Oh, they just they're just trying to copy the Beatles. They've got some complicated stuff going on there. And it's interesting to me that you know you really your career kicked off playing Beatles songs and Beatlemania, and now you're you're you're, you're playing in ELO. Uh, which has some similarities, I think, to Beatles. Or is that overstated, or is, is that appropriate? No, he absolutely. Jeff Lynn is the uh, writer, and main guy in Electric Light Orchestra. Um, he he definitely. It's, it's obvious that he's emulating the Beatles so much so that when when they put out the anthology records, uh, the Beatles anthology records, uh, Jeff Lynn produced the two new tracks that were, um, you know, like they, uh, Yoko Ono gave a couple of cassettes to, to them and they finished uh, John's uh, work tape. Um, yeah, so he ended up actually producing. You know, so th there's no, I don't think there's any question about uh, what a Beatles fan he is. Well, and Lynn certainly got his, uh, his due over the years with... Uh uh, with that, and then uh, I'm thinking of his work with Tom Petty and the Traveling Wilburys. I mean, he was really recognized as somebody who had a unique uh, sound and, and approach. Talented guy. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, listen, um, folks, uh, you can see my former neighbor, we, and I've avoided talking about any of that. There's not really that much to talk about. It was all proximity. There was no, he was five years older than me. What can I say? Uh, but you can see my former neighbor, uh, Glenn Burtnick, live in concert with the orchestra at Ruth Eckerd Hall in Clearwater, Florida on Friday, January 31st. Uh, you can get tickets online at RuthEckerdHall.com. I saw from their website that there's a dinner package, a pre-show package. You know, you can you can get in for a little bit and just see the show. You can get in for a lot and have dinner. Uh, I, I don't think there's a meet and greet. They weren't advertising that, but uh, you never know. We're um, not a meet and greet band, but I do want to say that I have played Ruth Eckerd Hall so many times with so many different acts. Really, I'm really blown away with it. when I saw that on this on the schedule. I'm like Ruth Eckerd Hall, I played there with John Wade. I played there with Patty Smythe. I played there with uh, Sticks a number of times with Sticks. Uh, I might have played there with Marshall Crenshaw, and now I'm playing there with the orchestra. It's just one of these stops that uh, I guess one makes when going to Florida. Well, it's a beautiful hall. I mean, you've been there enough, you know. It's a sensational hall. The, the acoustics are great. It looks great. Um, that's great. And I'm just, I'm just sorry to say that this is, this is the first time I actually knew you were coming through in all these years. I, I didn't make the connection. Of course, you know, we didn't have Facebook through all those years, so it was hard to know, you know, what you were doing. But uh, it's very cool. Um, uh, you've, uh, you've got your website. Uh, it's glennburtnick.com. It's uh, Glenn with one N. I think you dropped the the second end uh, the second end many years ago, um, and I know you're on Facebook. People can find you on Facebook. You're very involved with uh, your friends and and fans on there. Are you on Twitter as well? Yeah, but I don't really update it often. Okay. And I, I see that you've uh, started a YouTube channel. You posted something, actually, from the the cats. Uh, you you guys had a reunion just this past month. Is that right? Yeah, 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 and yeah. There was well, I think yeah, I. I the encore or something was a twist and shout, so I decided to uh, not play guitar and just uh, video everyone 
from my perspective. So I was the lead singer in the song, but while I'm singing, I've got a mic in one hand, I've got my iPhone in another, and it's like the Glen Cam, I call it. <laughs> it's kind of a, a different perspective. It's very cool. I tell people to, to look that up. It, you can, I think you can just search Glenn Burtnick on YouTube, and it's the most recent clip as we're recording this. It's very cool because, yeah, Glenn, Glenn is holding the, the, the camera, and he's showing the audience. He's showing the guys in the band. At one point, he turns it on himself just so you can see that it is him, and he's singing. And, you know, if you didn't see it was Glenn, you would wonder because that version of Twist and Shout is rather Beatlesque, I would say. Um, was it uh, how long had, had it been since you had played with the uh, cats with you guys had gotten together well that would have been uh, there was about three years ago there was another reunion and um, so but before then it was probably you know 20 years mm. so. uh, you guys sounded good you looked good so it was it's a fun video i encourage people to pick that up and there's plenty of other glenn burtnick video uh, out there on youtube so you can look that up uh glenn uh it was a, a pleasure to to catch up with you i'm sure this is uh probably the longest conversation we have ever had because the only other one i recall is uh saying no you you hold the guitar like this no your fingers go here and i'd be just completely lost i have no idea my daughter by the way is an extraordinary guitar player i just want to say so it skipped a generation Wow. Well, I, you know, I'm a, I, I feel a, a slight bit like a failure. <laughs> our virtuoso, but I'm really happy to hear that your daughter did. Yeah. So you don't have to give my mom the five bucks back, okay? Uh, listen. Uh, my best to your family. It was great to see you today, and uh, thanks really for joining us, Mr. Media. Thank you. That was fun. Um, maybe just, yeah, okay, now you look a little hungover. All right, now I'm seeing it.